<laughs> My name is uh, Linda King. I'm a member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribe. Um, I work at Salish Kootenai College as an instructor in the Native American Studies field and some of the art classes here at Salish Kootenai College. I originally started beading when I was 20 or 19. I'm not sure now. It's been so long ago, it's hard to remember. <laughs> and um, it, it started out as just kind of a hobby, something to spend my time on, my downtime. Um, I was married at 19. I had, my husband had three boys. And then later on, we had a little girl. And so it was instantly four kids and, you know, um, well, maybe I need to think about what can I do to help my family and support them. Because having four children and a husband that worked, and, and, and it's, it's really hard. So I decided, well, maybe I should look into extending this out a little bit and see what kind of a market there is for it. And, and how do I go about doing that? Well, I, I started beading and um, I'd, I'd go to powwows and then I started talking to vendors that were at the powwows. And they had these big, beautiful stands with silver jewelry and, and pottery and beadwork. And so I, I, I guess I kind of adopted this one man. And he's like a brother to me. Um, and he goes all over the United States selling beadwork and silver and those kinds of things. So I really got friendly with him and got to know, well, I picked his brain for what knowledge he had and what I could use of the knowledge that he had to create my own business. And so what actually kind of ended up happening is we, we formed a partnership. He says, well, if you need jewelry, silver jewelry, you know, I'll get you the silver jewelry and we'll trade for beadwork and things like that. So when I started trading with him, I started realizing how much my things were really worth. So this great big light bulb came on, you know, and it's like, oh, okay. So now I know what my things are worth. So then I started taking them and, and started selling them. Designs, well, they just usually come out of the blue. Oh, no. <laughs> Sometimes I'll have a dream, and in that dream I will see an image, or I'll see a, a dance outfit, or, or something. Or when I have students come into my class and they say, well, I don't really know what I want to do. And then I say, well, what are you, who are you going to do it for? Take that into consideration. The colors that they look good in. Um, designs and things like that and then usually it just kind of starts this snowball effect because then she'll think about what I said and saying maybe well maybe just a red cloth velvet dress with shells on it well then it just starts rolling and they say oh yes and then I could put uh, this type of belt or we could do this with the leggings and then it just starts rolling and then the designs just all end up just going together really good so there isn't this great big process of planning this um, you know, well, I want this to be this way and this to be this way. It's just kind of a snowball effect where it starts with maybe a dress, maybe a pair of moccasins, and then we just build on that and just keep it rolling until it, we have a complete. There are a lot of traditional designs that we have here in this reservation, and I guess a lot of those are floral designs, animal designs. So I guess the tribe, the area that the tribe is in, that's what they try to incorporate into the designs and things. Uh, mountains, teepee images, things like that. Buffalo are pretty important to our people. Um, they were here when we were here. Um, they started vanishing and uh, well, my grandfather, or great-great-great-grandfather, Michelle Pablo, uh, him and Allard had had the herd, and they were trying to bring them back and, and things like that. The buffalo, um, the skulls were used for Sundance. I know the Salish people, I'm, I'm not too sure about this, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't believe that the Salish people did Sundance, but we did have Sundance on this reservation, Kootenai people. And that's a really important part of the Sundance, is having the buffalo, the skull. It's a very, very important part of that. Traditionally, every part of the buffalo was used, the scrotum, for spoons and rattles and all different sorts of things. So yes, 
the bones for some of the shoulder bones and things for scraping. Um, every piece was used. The buffalo would be uh, a very good um, sign, image for business people, you know, in starting the business and using all of the resources that their hands are, that they can get their hands on to, to start that business and to be successful. Stealing designs, oh, that's a, that's a tough issue. Um, my designs, I don't feel that they're my designs. They were given to me by the creator and uh, they were his designs, not my designs. And I have no problem if somebody actually kind of, I think, well, gee, they must have liked that design. I feel kind of honored that they'd want to use it on their outfit or whatever, you know, so that that doesn't really bother me. I don't have a problem with that because they weren't my uh, designs in the first place. They were they were given they were gifts to me, and they need to be gifts for everybody. It, it, I guess in marketing there are things that you can market and you can't market. Um, one of the things you wouldn't want to try to market would be eagle feathers. I know in a lot of different areas sometimes parts are really animal parts like claws teeth, things like that. I know certain states prohibit sales of those kinds of things, and so you have to be really careful in what you do sell in certain areas, because you can, you can be arrested and you can get into trouble. I found a teacher and a very good friend, and this was back in the early 70s that I met him. Well, I guess the reason that he helped me was he wanted the beadwork because it was a really good, I mean, it could be marketed and he could just make really good money off of it. And so he thought, well, hey, I can, maybe I get to need to get to know her too because we can both do each other favors here and really make our businesses work. I know in, in starting a business and especially a bead business or a craft business, it's really hard to stay in one location, in a small building or whatever, because you have, your overhead is so expensive. Whereas if, like the partnership that we formed, when he would go to Powell's, I would give him, as, give him as much as I possibly could so that he could take out and sell. Then when that would sell, then that would get turned back into supplies and things like that for the shop and pay for some of the bills in the shop. I guess my significant other is really in the field of art. And so I never really um, done anything like having an art show in a gallery. And then of course, after people see the exhibit that is up, they wanna purchase some things. And so, so that kinda started the ball rolling for, for doing museums and getting into those kinds of things in gift shops and galleries. Corky Claremont. Who is Corky Claremont? A lot of people around the Salish Kootenai College just plain call him artsy fartsy because if they want to know anything about the art world and what's happening out there, they go see Corky Claremont. Corky Claremont, um, I'm not sure what his uh, role at SKC, I guess anytime it deals with art, they send it to Corky and Corky deals with that. Um, in my life, Corky's been very helpful in getting me exposure to galleries and museums and things like that. And since Corky and I have been together, I'm, we've done many shows together with his artwork. Uh, Micah, Montana Indian contemporary artists, getting to know all of those people in that area. Um, doing shows with them in different galleries and things, it's really helped. I guess maybe get my work a little more exposed than maybe other people in the area who are doing earrings and maybe starting out a little smaller level with, with earrings and things like that. Um, I guess what I can tell them is don't give up, just keep going and just get bigger and better and just practice. <laughs> radical art, Corky Claremont, maybe that's what he's known best for, <laughs> is his radical art. Um, Talking about radical art, I really like his art. Um, he really makes the person think about his piece that he does. Um, I guess recently, he, about a year ago, when the Yellowstone Pipeline trucks were running across our reservation along the river, he did a series of uh, 15 prints 
in commenting on that. And in these prints, he had images of uh, danger signs, the animal skulls, and things like that. And then he would incorporate photographs of these trucks doing 70 and 80 miles an hour down these curvy rows on, on the river. And his comment he was making, you know, should they be doing that? Because it's very, it can affect the animals, it can affect the water, it can affect, you know, if one of them were to wreck and spill this stuff all over, you know. It, it, so it really, I think his work really makes people think. Another piece, we were down in um, South Dakota at a conference. And he wanted to go out to Mount Rushmore. And he asked me, he was, come on, let's go out to Mount Rushmore. I said, I don't want to go see those guys. I know what they look like. I don't have, need to see them carved into the Black Hills. You know, I, you know I, I'd rather not go. I said, you go ahead and go. So he went up and he, of course it was a cloudy day and couldn't see the, the images very well. So he went into the, to the gift shop and of course he started buying these uh, slides of, the, of Mount Rushmore and these beautiful pictures and everything. And he came back and he must have thought for probably, well, who knows how long this, this art piece was in the work, but he decided he was going to do it. And he'd gone to, was it Gray Falls? Well, I can't remember where the piece first showed, but what he did was he did these silhouettes on the wall. Silhouettes on this side of regular touristy type people, Europeans, things like that. And over on this side, he did uh, silhouettes of uh, native people. And on these silhouettes that he painted, he stuck different articles, like some of my bead work, you know, bolo ties, belt buckles, things like uh, sunglass holder things for their sunglasses. And then he put sunglasses on all of these people. And on the, on the typical tourist family over here on this side, the images that they were seeing on, that were on their sunglasses was the, the president's faces, you know, on, on the rock. And then over here, the Indian people, the images that they seen in their glasses were skulls. So that, that piece was pretty um, controversial. In Great Falls, I know they banned the show and refused to let the school kids go and view this because they didn't feel that the docents in the museum were able to explain why Indian people would see that image and tourist, regular tourist people would see the president's images. But you know, to the native people of that area, that is a very sacred, special place, you know, for them and was used for a lot of different things, very sacred, and, you know, to carve that up and deface that was really, you know, so that's, I'm sure, you know, why. And I guess maybe the schools didn't want that known or something. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> What's special it's about Agnes Kimmel? Everything about Agnes is special. Um, the way that she works with her students, um, the way that she interacts with people, um, Okay. She's everybody's grandma. I mean, everybody's grandma. Doesn't there doesn't have to be any blood there? She's just everybody's grandma, and she's just a very incredible, remarkable, uh, strong Indian woman. That uh, I think we need more strong Indian women like that that aren't afraid to to get out there and do what they do and do what they do well, you know, and then market that. She sells her art, and her art is those beautiful, beautiful buckskin hides that uh, she creates. And uh, it's really funny, you know, we, her, her little hide tanning shed is just around the corner from my classroom. And uh, the students, sometimes I, I share students with her, and they come in, and boy, Agnes was really rough on us today. And I said, well, were you trying to be a little lazy? And they said, well, yeah, maybe we were a little lazy. We didn't want to do what she asked us to do. And so she was really tough on us. And I said, well, you know, those are things that you really need to do, and you really need to do them right. And she's making sure that you you get that, that information, that you're doing it right. And, well, let's see. Thinking about Agnes Ken Mill and, and our relationship and, and uh, things that we've kind of gone through. I remember I was working on a new dress, 
and it was red and it had smoked buckskin and my dad had just beaded me a belt and crown uh, with the red roses with a white background and and I was thinking well maybe this outfit I'll just put it together with pieces that other people have done and I said, oh, okay, okay. So I thought, let's see, who would I want? My dad did my belt. I had a girlfriend of mine do my hair pieces. Um, moccasins, I need moccasins. Let's see, who would, if I wanted a pair of moccasins, and if I didn't make them, who would I want to make them? And I thought, Agnes Kenwell would be my first choice, of course. And so I went up there to visit her one day, and I said, Agnes, I, I need a pair of moccasins with roses on them. Could you, could you make me a pair of moccasins with roses on it? She said, well, just a minute. I'll be right back. And she left, and she was gone for a few minutes. And pretty soon she came back, and she threw this hide at me, and she's here. Make them yourself. I said, but, but, but. And she just hustled me right out of there before I had a chance to say, but I really wanted moccasins that you'd make. She just gave me the hide. She says, it's going to cost you this much. And I gave her that much, you know, but she just disappeared for a few minutes, came back, threw this buckskin at me, and she says, you know how to make them. You make the moccasins. So, of course, I took that hide, and I, I did make my moccasins, but... Maybe someday I will get those moccasins that Agnes made. I'm hoping someday. <laughs> First, I was really disappointed because I really wanted something that she'd made. And, but then on the other hand, you know, what she, what, I guess what she was really telling me, hey girl, you know how to do it. You can do this. You can do just as good a job as I can. And I want you to do it because it's something you need to do for you, not me need to do for you. It's something you need to do for yourself. So I guess that was kind of what she was trying to get at in that. Well, right now it's really kind of hard to market my product because I have no product because my students are keeping me really, really busy. Um, but I guess in working with him, that really helped me broaden my marketing abilities um, in going with him and doing some of the, the powwows and conferences that we would go to, um, he would have contacts or his regular customers that, that ordered some things. And so he kind of started to share some of those people with me. And so they would ask me to do something. I would do it for them. Of course, then they're out in the public and people would see what, well, where did you get that? And who made it? And I'd really like to get one. So um, I guess a business, little business card with my name and address just started flying all over the different places because I always sent cards with him. And of course, he was pretty choosy about who he gave them to because then I was trying to, starting to infringe on his part a little bit. But um, he was really open and honest and, and really encouraging me to really get out there and start doing some of that stuff on my own. <clears throat> U.S. West has been an exceptionally good customer. I've done probably thousands of pens, writing pens, beaded pens. And then I remember one day, Joe asked me into his office, and I went in, and he says, Joe McDonald from Salish Kootenai College, and he says, Linda, he says, uh, U.S. West called me, and they want to know if you can do some beaded golf club covers for the woods. <laughs> and I said, beaded what? And I thought, ah, something I haven't done. This sounds like a challenge. And I said, well, sure, I'll try to do that. And so... Uh, when they got finished, I think Joe almost didn't want to send them to U.S. West, but <laughs> he did anyway. Well, actually, I don't know if it's a product that I'll continue to make, but there are a few special orders, and I would probably do maybe one or two sets. I don't like to flood the market with one product. I like to be pretty creative and try not to overdo it. I don't know that they sense that Angie and my work is better than other people's work, it's very noticeable because of the color that's put into that. Um, using the type of beads, cut beads, for the last probably five or six years, sometimes it's been really difficult in getting cut beads. So, um, you know, we were hearing a lot of different things, you know. Our cut beads are coming out of Czechoslovakia, communist country. They only set, ship out so much. They only export so much. And so we only can get so much. And a lot of the people weren't getting the beads that we were getting or had 
um, I guess maybe the outlets on where to get those kinds of beads. So maybe that's one of the reasons that, that we, we started getting more money for our work because we were using the cut beads, you know, and we had other areas to, to get those beads and other outlets that we knew through people um, that were connected with my friend Jerry Suko, um, who kind of adopted me and I adopted him and we formed that partnership and then the beadwork really started going out all over because he's from Alaska to Chicago, New York, Hawaii. I mean, he's been all over selling, selling beadwork. So, um, I have a gallery in D.C. that has bought in quite a bit of my work. Uh, some really good friends of the college, uh, John and Pam King. Uh, Pam was working on getting us a building for the arts. Um, they have been very, very helpful to the college and, and helpful to me because, and Angie, because Angie has work in this gallery and I have work in this gallery. And Well, my business, let's see, it's kind of, the business has kind of been put on hold a little bit. My business is selling beadwork, beads, craft supplies, things like that. Um, the business has kind of been put on hold because I've kind of adopted almost every student at Salish Kootenai College, and I know um, a lot of them have families and children that want to dance, and the monies are just not there for them. So. What I end up doing is pretty much giving them the supplies for cost right now. And I think it's really important that we get our young people headed that direction on a good path and not down that path of um, alcohol and drugs and things like that. Some of the things that we're doing in class is making traditional dance outfits, whether it be jingle, fancy, traditional, grass. Um, those types of things. And so the supplies consist of feathers, um, beads, material for dresses, yarns for the grass on the grass dance, jingle cones. Uh, the jingle cones in our area run, I would say, about 65 cents a cone if you buy them from the retailers around here. Um, I can get them for wholesale for a lot less, and so the student doesn't have this seven, eight hundred dollars into an outfit, they can do them as, as low as twenty and thirty dollars with getting the supplies at cost. A lot of the items that are used are protected things and you can't purchase them like the eagle feathers and things like that. Um, it takes a long time to earn those. So a lot of times what they will do for, for younger kids that are just starting out dancing, you can buy turkey feathers, hand-painted turkey feathers. They're really, really nice. And you don't have to worry about the, the kids just sitting down on those, those real eagle feathers. And, you know, it gets them used to having that bustle on their back. And so they know they have to be really careful when they have it on. So yes, a lot of the supplies are protected. And <clears throat> those are something that we can't buy. So the student usually works on accumulating those kinds of things so that they can put together a bustle or a headdress or something like that. Oh, um, eagle feathers are earned in a lot of different ways. Um, a lot of our students that graduate from high school will get a eagle feather for graduation. So through education, things that they've done that have been, you know, outstanding, helping in the community and stuff, people will present them with, with things like that. A lot of the feathers are presented uh, by someone older than they are, um, knows the things that they've been doing, uh, recognizes that, and that's one way of letting the student know that they are recognized and they are doing the right thing and going the right way with their life and what they're doing with, with their education and things. I think the things that, that I'm doing in my classes um, gives them the opportunity. I know when I was young, I didn't have the opportunity or the supplies or any of the knowledge to do those kinds of things, to dance at powwows and things. All of my friends were dancing and my mom and dad always went to powwows, but we never, I never really got 
an outfit to dance. And so that was something that I always really wanted to do. And I always didn't have the money and those kinds of things and the knowledge to know how to put it together. So I guess a lot of my classes um, are teaching those students how to do some of those things. And then it's also giving them the opportunity to buy the supplies at a lower cost. So it's not costing them a lot of money. So I think it really gets those kids going down a really good good path of, of going to POWs and dancing and taking part in their culture, which I guess when I was younger, that wasn't really something that we thought about. We went out and hanged, hung out at the teen center and danced around that type, modern dancing. And I think it's really important to maintain our culture that we get our young people really into the culture and dancing and taking part in the things that we're doing here on the reservation. I guess when I really started out, Doug Allard was a customer of mine and I would take beadwork down to him. And I remember this one story. I got into his shop and I don't know if he was having it rough that year or not, but he wouldn't give me what I wanted for my beadwork. And uh, I just said, okay, that's, that's all right. I don't need to sell it to you. And I, I packed up my beadwork and I started to walk out the door and he says, oh, now Linda, don't be that way. Okay, okay, I'll give you what you want for it. <laughs> and, it was, and it was really funny. And, and some 15 years later, after I'd done that, uh, my daughter, Angie Adamson, started doing the same type of things that I did because she was a full-time student. Both her husband and her were full-time students. They had two little boys and so it was really kind of hard in making ends meet. And so she started doing beadwork and, and of course checking all of the, mar the markets that were available. Of course she went to Doug Allard's because Doug Allard has the trading post and, and he does sell quite a bit of beadwork, you know, and things like that. And so she'd gone in one day and Maybe he was having a tough day again, and he didn't want to give her what she wanted for it. And <laughs> it was really funny because she did the same thing that I did. Of course, I've always tried to, you know, tell her that, you know, you are the artist. You know what, what your, wor your work is worth, and you should always get what your work is worth, you know. And so she did the same thing that I did, and Doug just, he just, oh, you are just so much like your mother. Get back here. <laughs> Angie and her business. Um, she, she got her degree in social services from Salish Kootenai College about a year and a half ago, something like that. And she's still beating not as much as she was because she does have another job. She did get a job with working with the tribe. But she is still doing the beadwork. And every year, um, she runs down to Santa Fe, the art market. She goes to the Santa Fe art market every year. So it's like she saves up all year just for the Santa Fe art market and then Did goes down. There? Some years she does really well. And then there are other years that maybe they're interested in other things than what she takes. And, and it's really kind of hard in judging, you know, year by year, what people are going to want. And so that's really difficult. So sometimes it's really hard to second guess them and decide, well, I'm going to put all of my time and efforts into making this when maybe something else would have sold better. So it's, it's kind of hard. I don't know that she wants to teach other people. You know, um, in, in starting out when she started, she would, she would come across a problem and she says, well, ha Mom, how do I deal with this problem? And I says, well, did you try this or did you try that? You know, so it was kind of a struggle for her to learn that process and how to get that, you know, it takes a lot of practice before your work gets to the quality that you want it to be at so that it's a good marketing tool. And then she says, well, I'm not very good at colors. And I says, well, that's a really important part. And I says, a lot of the colors that I use are those fire colors, those rainbow colors, you know, and then use a solid color background for, you know, if you're going to do a geometric design and things like that. And then if you're creating a rose, um, look at the flower. I mean, get a rose and really look at it and try to get the dimension in the color shading and things so that you can get it to actually look like a rose. And so that took her a long time in learning that process. And it's like, well, I have this skill now and I don't know if I want to share it because if I start sharing it, then everybody's going to start doing it. And then I'm going to run myself right out of business by by showing those things. So, I, you know, I'm not sure if she really wants other people to have that knowledge and to know how to do that. <laughs>
<laughs> Taiwan beadwork. Copying designs. Oh, I don't know. That's a, that's a real tough issue. I, it, in ways, it bothers me. Um, but m every year, it seems like they're coming out with a new law that protects Native people from those kinds of things from uh, stealing designs and then trying to sell it at lower prices, you know, getting Japanese beadwork and things like that. It has to be labeled, you know, this is Native American artwork or this is Japanese or this is Taiwanese or, you know, it, it has to be labeled. So I guess that law may have gone into effect about maybe four years ago, because it really started to become a problem. Um, I know a lot of people that I know um, would um, go to different places and see all this Japanese stuff, and people would want to get that before they would uh, want to buy the more expensive stuff. And so people started bringing those issues up with the Montana Arts Council and things like that in the art community. And so, um, you know, more questions were being brought up about it, so it started to be talked about, you know, well, what can we do to help prevent a lot of this from happening? And so that's kind of how that law, I guess, came into being. I think there's a lot of opportunities for our young people to really get into the Native arts and really study that and really learn maybe the old ways that they were done. There's a lot of people, a lot of resources here on this reservation. A lot of elders that, uh, um, you know, a lot of them are willing to share some of that stuff and get those kids going down the right path. Yes, I think you can make a really good living with Indian art, um, but everybody you know, you need to pick their brains and find out what they know, and especially if they're in the marketing area. You know, you really need a lot of knowledge on who to see, who to talk to, and things like that. I had a lot of really um, great people in my life. Um, in 70, what was it, 72, they run an article in the newspaper about me, uh, my beadwork and starting the business and things. And then that, that kind of blossomed into this other area that these people called me and they said, Linda, we work with the SBA and uh, we'd like to do a colored catalog for you. So they put me in touch with people from the SBA that worked with me in developing this color calendar that I could send out to people, the price sheets, the order sheets, and things like that. And then it seemed like something else turned around and I got to know somebody else out of that encounter with the SBA. You know, and it just, it'll just snowball and, and don't be afraid to ask. Words of wisdom to people out there are starting new businesses or wanting to get into that field is if you want to do it and you're thinking about it, hey, go for it. Ask as many questions as you can. Get as much knowledge as you possibly can. Learn as much as you possibly can. I mean, I can't, I can't, I guess, say that enough is the more information you have, the more prepared you are to deal with certain things that are going to come up out there. I, I really feel that business classes at Salish Kootenai College are really important to people wanting to do that because so many people don't understand the processes that you need to go through sometimes. And sometimes that can get them into trouble, you know. So it's really good to take those classes and to learn, uh, you know, how to do a business plan to see if it really is feasible and it really will work. I mean, those are really, really important things, and I think um, that those classes are, are really helpful to all of the students that are thinking about opening businesses and starting up. Because you can, you can want to start up a business. I know a lot of people, well, I'm going to start this business, and they just go into it, and then three months down the road, they have to close because they can't, they can't sustain that business. It's not. They haven't thought about it enough or planned hard enough and long enough to, to get, pull all of that information together to be able to stay open. 20 years from now, let's see, I guess I would like to see more of our young people really getting into the culture and cultural arts. Um, I see a growing tend to, you know, it's going that way, but it seems like it's taken a really long time to go that way. So I really hope that 
in 20 years, if somebody wants to dance, they're going to have an outfit and be able to dance. Um, you know, if there's a powwow that they want to go to, they'll be able to go to that powwow and, and have a really good time. Neither one of us are making a lot of money on our art, but we're making people think. <laughs> hey, this is one way of getting our culture out there and maintaining it and preserving it and keeping it going.